be here. My name is Stuart Walker, and I'm going to be giving a short uh, overview of my new book, Designed for Resilience, uh, to set the scene and then open it up for questions. So the talk will be about 15 minutes. So we should have about 15 minutes left for uh, questions and discussion. So I'm going to share the screen, see how this works. Uh, So is everybody seeing that okay? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I've been writing about uh, design and sustainability for many years. And what I've learned from that uh, is that if we are to get even close to healing some of the damage we've wrought on the planet over the last 200 years, and especially since the second half of the 20th, 20th century, we need to develop an entirely different approach, a new worldview, if you like, based on a different set of values. My aim in writing the book was to explore what resilience looks like, and particularly what design for resilience looks like in different areas of human activity. So there are, there are three parts to the book resilience, precedence, and resilience by design. In part one, I look at the background theory and meaning of resilience, including amongst other things, the historical development of industrial society, which set us on a path of environmental destruction. An example of pre-modern industry that used natural energy sources and was less wasteful and of human scale. I look at the notion of appreciative design. Instead of thinking about design as a problem-solving activity, this is an approach which involves taking the current situation and identifying positive opportunities that emerge from an existing context. And I highlight the importance of developing a greater level of design criticism, because it's largely absent from current education and professional practice. In part one, I also consider product developments that have undoubtedly made life more convenient and comfortable, but in the process have been much more damaging to the natural environment. Here we see the development of writing, for example, from purely natural materials using a goose quill and oak gall ink through different stages, each one becoming more convenient to use, but also more wasteful and damaging to the natural environment. This pattern has been repeated in virtually every aspect of human activity, but the price of convenience and affordability has been environmental devastation. And in the process, our overall quality of life has become diminished, not least because of a growing anxiety about environmental collapse. The precedence section looks at objects and practices that have existed in one form or another in societies all around the world for centuries, or even in some cases, millennia. These examples are not products of our modern, highly destructive worldview, but instead they span different worldviews from ancient to modern and from east to west. When things have been present in human societies for such a long time, irrespective of language, culture, and beliefs, we can be sure that taken together, they tell us something important about ourselves, about who we are, and about what really matters to us. These objects and practices point to what is needful, what is meaningful, and permanent in human cultures. I'm interested in what they can tell us about how and what we should be designing today whether they are traditional chairs and tables and lamps and things like that, or more contemporary technological products. From the issues I explored in part one, I begin part two by developing pillars of resilience comprising practical, social, personal, and economic factors, all of which are considered in relation to a variety of issues critical for resilience and sustainable futures. 
These pillars provide a basis for thinking about the various precedents. The precedent examples are drawn from five important areas of life, home, food, culture, play, and spirit. The first set are related to resilient home. This section considers nine different precedents, which are conceptually and technologically rather basic, but all of which have been used for a very long time. On the whole, they are well made using local materials and they are environmentally responsible. They don't require packaging and disposable plastics, and they create little waste. Are these sufficient for our needs? Are they a better alternative than luxury, especially if that luxury means being without good quality air or water and without wildlife and the natural world? What can we learn from them about how to design today? This is an example of ad hocism, which employs any suitable material or object that comes to hand in order to improvise an effective solution. It's a creative activity characterized by spontaneity and expediency. But is this design? Is this resilient design? It's certainly a very ancient practice. In fact, the oldest artifact in the British Museum is an example of ad hocism. It's a chopping tool fashioned from a suitable, suitably sized stone. Contemporary designers have made frequent forays into ad hocism as an antidote to established corporate conventions. But the results have been mixed. There's a spontaneity and a naivety to true ad hocism that is virtually impossible to achieve when you're a trained designer. The second set of precedents concern resilient food. Here, I look at a variety of artifacts and practices related to the acquisition and preparation of food, including community agriculture and irrigation methods that are mentioned in the Old Testament in writings from the 7th century BCE and are still in widespread use today in countries all around the Mediterranean. <coughs> this is one of the best examples of holistic design that I've come across. It's the traditional halibut fishing hook of the indigenous peoples of the Pacific Northwest. It's a remarkable piece of design. As you can see here, it is traditionally made entirely from natural materials and is designed to catch only the smaller male halibut, thus allowing the egg bearing females to stay in the ocean. So stocks are maintained. It's also locally made using craft skills passed on from one generation to the next. And it's based on a deep knowledge of place and of the local ecology. The carvings also express spiritual beliefs and symbolize the transition between land and sea. And I also consider different aspects of human culture. These include everything from music, theater, and dance to different forms of bodily adornment, as well as writing, communication, and storytellings, and things like public goods, such as footpaths and styles, which can be found all over Britain. And they allow ordinary people to have access to natural areas, even when these areas are privately owned. These are very ancient rights of way that crisscross the whole country and are still maintained and used by hundreds of thousands of people every year. Many of these cultural precedents are related to practices that contribute to the building of communities, common understandings and tolerance. They're also related to our sense of identity and a sense of belonging. 
The section on play includes toys, board games, and sports, particularly local amateur sports, as you can see here, which are quite different from professional sports. When considering toys for children, I refer to an article from some years ago that appeared in Wired magazine, in which were listed what they considered the five best toys. Now, Wired, Wired's magazine's focus is on new technologies and that are affecting uh, culture and the economy today. So you'd expect their list to include high-tech toys and video games, but it wasn't the case. All the toys on the list are very basic things. None have any specific use, but all of them allow a child's imagination to flourish. They include a stick, an old cardboard box, a piece of string, a cardboard tube, and perhaps best of all, dirt. And the last section in the precedence section is spirit, which has become much neglected in modern economically developed economies. But in different spiritual traditions, these practices help build and bind communities together. And this section includes a discussion of the relatively recent art of Shinrin Yoku, or forest bathing. But even though it's a contemporary practice, it's a modern incarnation of traditions that have very deep roots in Japanese culture and strong associations with Shintoism, Buddhism, and Zen spirituality. Shinrin Yoku is the practice of spending time in the forest, walking slowly and immersing oneself in nature. While it began through an intuitive sense that it was good for a person's well being, since its introduction, scientific research has confirmed its many health benefits. However, it's not just the physical health. All spiritual traditions recognize the importance in our deeper, of our deeper spiritual needs, and they offer opportunities for contemplation and more thoughtful meaning-seeking modes of being. The final section of the book develops an understanding of resilience by design. <coughs> Excuse me. Resilience by design. It analyzes, interprets, and contemplates not just the findings from parts one and two, but also the ethos and understanding of human values necessary to develop a more resilient future. And I conclude the book with 10 principles of design for resilience, in which things like integrity, virtue, responsibility, and ethics all feature prominently. In terms of the overall style of the book, the writing style, and in keeping with the creative process itself, I include lots of images, some of which I've shown here, and also forms of writing that embrace reason and imagination, which is not so typical in academic books. So there are chapters that draw on history and theory, and I use rational argument and practical examples. But there are also personal anecdotes, fictions, satire, poetry, and polemic. Taken together, these represent widely different ways of knowing and understanding ourselves and our world. And I feel this range of styles is important and part and parcel of changing the narrative about how we see ourselves in the world, that is, our world view. So thank you for your, uh, your attention and inviting me to speak. And I'd be happy to answer any questions or hear any comments you might have. So let's open it up to discussion. Thank you. <coughs> so does anybody have any questions or thoughts, responses? I wonder if you might talk a bit about photography. 
Uh, okay, I've just looking for how I open the chat here. I can't. I wonder if you might talk a bit about the role of photography in your work. Someone has asked. Well, uh, as you can see, I I spend quite a lot lot of time uh, using photography in my books, all my books, and I think I've got about eleven or twelve now. Uh, they've all they all uh, have quite a lot of photography in them of objects and uh, and related aspects of my writing. And uh, I think any design book, uh, any or any any book about design really has to feature. Uh, images of some form because that's the nature of the of the discipline um, so it's important to show not just tell uh, how design can be expressed can be manifested can be changed um, and we and that's best shown through an image so I, I'm quite particular about my imagery I I uh, I spend time doing it. I collect photographs wherever I go um, <coughs> on the off chance that uh, they might be useful in my writings. Uh, but then I also do studio photography, as you could see with some of the objects I included in, in the talk there, um, because I think it's vital for design books to actually deal with uh, the outputs of design, which are normally visual outputs. I hope that's answered your question, whoever it was. Anybody else? Oh, I can hear a sound. Does anybody else have any questions or thoughts? If you don't want to speak up, you can put something in the chat if you prefer. Or we could just sit and look at each other. Okay, well, I guess if there's no other questions, we could, oh, some questions in person. I've seen a comment, some questions in person. Okay. Well, if somebody's got a question, we have a question in Toronto. Just working out the mic, okay? <laughs> Not technology, eh? Shall I jump in in the meantime? Catherine, yes. By all means, do. Hi, uh, Stuart. My, yeah, I'm Catherine uh, Gillis, and I'm based in Vancouver, BC. Uh -huh. Uh, and I teach uh, design at Emily Carr University. Right, one, two. And we're very familiar with your work. Uh, I think you have a lot of uh, fans <laughs> at Emily Carr. And, Just getting uh, a mic to the person asking a question. Oh, it sounds like there's an open. It sounds like somebody's coming over the, uh, the, the, the mic in the room. Yeah. You pass her the mic? I can hold off on mine if they get going because... You know, it's technologically more. Hello. Oh, awesome. Hello. Hi. Um, great talk. Thank you. I really, I, I like the the images within your book, and I really like hindsight in order to look at foresight. So I see that you've gone through a lot of precedents in order to come to these pillars of resilience. And I'm wondering, uh, you you talked about how we are weighing a little bit worse for the environment versus convenience, comfort, and affordability. Um, and you come up with these pillars, and I'm wondering, we have all these things, all this precedence, how would you apply this right now to a disruptive technology such as AI? <laughs> yeah, well, it's a good question about AI. I mean, I think, uh, I think thoughtfully used, AI has a, has a lot of potential to be beneficial. I mean, it's already uh, uh, done some fantastic work with antibiotics and in uh, in 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 finding new kinds of antibiotics when we haven't had any for decades and uh and in creating uh links so to to uh to allow paraplegics to to walk again for example creating those those spinal links so it it, it it's having a lot of uh medical applications which can be very positive uh i think it has to be very carefully used i mean it's, it's a fairly new 
technology, uh, which draws on a huge amount of human knowledge and possibilities. What we do with that is very, it can be very powerful, but so we need to treat it with, with care. Um, but as you can see from, from many of the precedents that I looked at from resilience, the things that, that we see in those precedents is that on the whole, they're relatively technologically simple um, and they express things which are fundamental to being human. Many of the other things that we enjoy in modern society are kind of additions to that, but not necessarily absolutely necessary. And uh, to lead a good life, uh, not just to, to lead a, a, a poor life, but to lead a good life. People have, have had led good lives without all, these, all this consumption for, for many, many centuries. And so I think we have to um, take stock of where we are and the impacts of, um, of our productions on the natural world, which are devastating. And if, if AI can, can do us good uh, in certain ways and help lead us out of this fix that we've created, all the better. But potentially it could be used to produce even more novelty, even quicker than we've ever had before. And, and spurk and promote consumption at an even faster rate. So, you know, like many other tools, it's a tool um, which we can use wisely or foolishly. And I think uh, we have a record, at least uh, in recent times, of using things quite foolishly because we we haven't taken into account the planet, and uh, and that's led to uh, a lot of negative issues that we now need to deal with and we need to deal with them very very quickly so yeah i mean i think we just have to think about it like we think about any other technology really we have to think about it judiciously and wisely and and uh, try to think ahead about what the implications are of what we're going to do not just the immediate uh, benefits i hope i've answered your question we had another question uh in process uh, when we had the question from the floor from Catherine. So maybe Catherine, you'd like to come back now and uh, and finish off your question. Yeah, thanks so much. And uh, yeah, no worries about that at all. I think I just introduced myself. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for the overview of your book. Um, it, uh, I think uh, will certainly be, um, I'll certainly be reading it, uh, and I think I appreciate the clarity of the structure. Um, when you think about, you know, this climate crisis that we're facing, this ecological crisis, um, in it's so complex um, and it goes so deep. Uh, in some ways, it's like a big cloud of, uh, you know, a, a, a giant mess. And how do you start to begin making moves towards? trying to ameliorate uh, the situation from various perspectives. Um, so I guess my, my question, it's probably a little unfair, but uh, you know, imagining us talking to design students, uh, industrial design, interaction, communication design students, how would you start, what is the way into you know, developing a direction of your practice that not just is sustainable, but could actually counter uh, uh, you know, the direction that we're going in, actually try and, you know, create uh, better pathways for ourselves. What's a practical way into making changes to our practice? Is the answer actually not to design? Um, how do we, how do we speak to, you know, the new generation of designers? Well, I think, uh, so, so the question is, if everybody heard it, the question is, uh, how do we, how do we take, uh, these 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 precedents and uh, th these requirements to design differently, and how do we teach uh, young designers going forward? What do we what do we ask them to do in order to develop these themes further? So uh, there's there there are lots of encouraging signs about how we're moving in a particular. There's lots of discouraging signs, obviously, but there are. There are lots of encouraging signs as well about how we should be moving forward and uh, more emphasis on localization and knowledge of place is a, is a big component of moving forward to more sustainable ways of doing, both to reduce 
food miles and so on, but also to, to create a more distributed form of economy, uh, a local economy based on local knowledge of, uh, of local resources. And that has many uh, advantages because if you, if you live in the place that you're producing things in, you're not going to destroy it because you live there. If you're importing stuff from wherever, you don't really care what happens in other places, maybe because out of sight, out of mind. And, uh, and that's been going on quite a long time. And so we don't have the first-hand knowledge of the impacts of our actions, where if, if we produce things locally, we have direct experience of those impacts. So that local knowledge is very important. In, and uh, I'm, I'm very heartened. I'm, <coughs> I'm from Wales. I'm, I'm Welsh. I'm also Canadian. I spent a lot of time living in Canada. Um, but... Uh, I'm heartened by the Welsh government's uh, recent legislation, which has legislated for what they call the well-being alliance and the well-being economy. And it's to ensure that any decisions made by government take into account its future impacts on future generations. And it's about the well-being of future generations and ensuring the well-being of future generations. And so they vet all their legislation and decision making. They have a special commissioner appointed to vet uh, the, the legislation and the direction they're taking in relation to the potential impacts on future generations with the, with the aim of ensuring the well-being for, for those who come after us. And that's a very positive move. Both uh, the, 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 the well-being economy in Wales and uh, the emphasis on localization, those things come together because that the, 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 the well-being economy is about more distributed forms of economy. And, and others are looking towards uh, indigenous wisdoms because indigenous wisdoms often have a profound and a very deep knowledge of place and the ecology of place. And in fact, a number of scientists in Canada and in Australia are looking to uh, Indigenous peoples to learn more about deep knowledge of place, because uh, Western forms of, uh, of biology and marine biology and so on tend to look at, at larger scale or they separate the marine from the freshwater and they don't see the connections. But uh, there are many of those connections on the Pacific West Coast, for example, around Vancouver with, with the salmon coming in from the salt water and going up to lay their eggs in the fresh water. So you have to have those, those, those dots being joined up in, in order to understand. And they found that the indigenous peoples of the West Coast often have that knowledge, whereas where they don't. So a great deal of emphasis on, on localization looking at the precedents of place and then understanding what why, why those precedents are like that in that place and they're they, they're partly related to culture but they're also partly related to function and availability of resources and all those things and spiritual beliefs and all those things have to come together to make a more holistic form of product so thank you for your question you're on mute, Catherine. Um, Catherine back? Am I, am I live? Yeah, 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 you're there. Can you hear me? Um, I'm trying to see if, I'm trying to make it so you can see me, but I can't figure it out. Here I am. Okay, yeah, I can see you. It's Cheryl. Hi. Oh, hi, Cheryl. <laughs> hi, Cheryl. <laughs> there you are. <laughs> So much for doing this today. It's been really a pleasure to correspond with you, and uh, we've really appreciated uh, hearing you uh, talk about uh, design for resilience. And I want to look at you on the screen. It's quite counterintuitive to not do that. Um, and uh, I wonder if you recognize the room. I wonder if I recognize. Did you say what? The room. Do you recognize the room? Uh, well, it's a little difficult to recognize because it's it's about the size of a postage stamp on oh. my screen. <laughs> well, we're in the OCAD auditorium. So yeah. Okay. I, I right. thought you might. Uh, you yeah. Might. Yeah. Oh, well, I have been because there you, for sure. You had a you had at least some tenure here, didn't you? Yes, I I was there a few times. Yes. Mm -hmm. So anyway, we just wanted to thank you, and uh, I see that uh, 
we have Emil, who's uh, following up um, as the next author. Um, so thank you so much for doing this today. And, thank you. Bye-bye. Uh, Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.